Thank you. I'm aware that we don't have much time, so I'll be very brief. We're going to take a really quick tour through a range of topics that are relevant to Agile FPJ development. If you'd like to discuss anything in more detail, please don't hesitate to come and speak to myself or my colleague Stuart during one of the breaks. We'd love to talk to you, so do come and find us. Everybody in this room will have different opinions about what Agile means, no doubt some more cynical than others. I'm hoping to convince you to shift towards the left-hand side of the slide during this presentation. To save time, I'm not going to spend ages trying to define the term Agile. However, we do need some working definition, so I'll make a couple of sweeping generalizations. Firstly, Agile is about collaboration. To deliver a successful product, we need to combine the talents of different engineering disciplines, but we also need effective collaboration between the engineers, management and the customer. Secondly, Agile means having the flexibility to respond to change. That could mean changing priorities, changes in requirements, changes in available technology, changes in our understanding of what the customer wants. Ultimately though, Agile is about developing a working product efficiently, while taking into account the fact that we're not particularly good at predicting the future. In fact, I would argue that we could really think of Agile as engineering our development process to make it more efficient. So the first thing we need to do when we're optimizing is to identify any inefficiencies. Many of the bottlenecks we have observed result from the overhead in incurred by having different teams working on the same product. These can manifest as interlocks in the development flow. Engineers become blocked waiting for dependencies or tasks that get repeatedly passed back and forth between teams. It's impossible to plan everything perfectly up front. And therefore, as we progress through the project, we deviate from the plan and our resources are no longer balanced. Similarly, different teams often duplicate work and this can pass unnoticed. As an example, a test bench might need to interact with configuration and status registers. So the verification team will write some convenience routines to poke the test bench from system Verilog. However, on real hardware, this job is performed by software and the stimulus routines in the test bench are duplicating the functionality of the production software. Communication within an organization is, is often referred to as an N-squared problem. So we have to divide up large projects into smaller teams to stay efficient, often using functional boundaries as the divide. We can also exacerbate this with the Chinese whisper style of communication where we end up with multiple layers of indirection between our engineers and the end users, making it harder to satisfy the customer's requirements. Another significant source of inefficiency is the cost of change. All too often projects are burdened with suboptimal implementations because the cost of updating something was too great, whether because the need to ensure backwards compatibility or an absence of tests or simply a reluctance to alter legacy code that's known to work. Over time, this reluctance to change can grow into a maintenance burden that isn't quantified or accounted for, and sometimes it even negatively affects unrelated projects years later. Finally, we find bugs too late in the development flow, and the cost of fixing a bug versus the project maturity is non-linear. Often, we only find issues at a final integration phase when all the components start talking to each other, and it's only then that we discover unwritten assumptions or specification features that have been interpreted differently by different, by different teams. One way to mitigate this problem is to integrate as early as possible. With the right environment, we can develop software against a block level simulation. This from the start style of integration allows us to flush out problems as early as possible, and also to reuse the production software in the verification of our RTL. It also allows us to create a complete vertical slice of our product, including the RTL, the software, the verification, and potentially even the hardware bring up for a sub block. And this gives us a clear indication of our overall progress. In order to integrate early, we need an environment that facilitates this collaboration. One of the reasons Potential Ventures created our open source Python verification framework was to enable all engineers to develop against the same code base. This means that the hardware designers, the verification engineers, and the software team all work with the same code at the same time. This has many advantages. For example, the reduction in communication overhead is substantial. It also avoids that situation where people ask you detailed questions about something you were doing six months ago and you've since thoroughly forgotten about. Python is a good language for this. It's accessible to engineers coming from different backgrounds, but it's also easy to call into C or C++ routines. But most importantly, it's blindingly fast to develop. 
Bringing hardware and software engineers together to collaborate on implementing and verifying a feature is one way to achieve improved communication. A large amount of implicit communication occurs between engineers that are working together and it's very difficult to capture or even impossible to formally track that communication. So we want to maximize this effect of the implicit communication. However, we can also build communication into the development flow as much as possible. A clear example of this might be the definition of configuration and status register maps. Software header files, hardware packages and documentation should all be generated from a single definition. Thus, we remove the possibility of a mismatch between the hardware and software's view of the, the registers, and we provide a controlled communication channel. But we can actually go one better than this and provide capabilities such as automatic versioning, which removes the burden of compatibility management. We're then free to make changes, even backwards incompatible changes, and the hardware and software will just work together. This dramatically reduces the cost of changing the interface between hardware and software, allowing us to pull out additional debug or add new features or tweak the behavior of the system as our understanding grows during the project. Similarly, we can build debug tools into our flow. For example, spitting out human readable printouts of the current configuration from the hardware or the simulation will make it much faster to check that the registers are correctly configured. With the right tools, these capabilities can add zero development overhead and yet make a huge impact on our productivity. Documentation is hugely important and often neglected, so it becomes out of date. For communication amongst developers, the best way to tackle this is to use executable documentation, for example in the form of assertions or unit tests. And we can even automatically create waveform diagrams from our unit tests, which are then included into some generated documentation. This becomes particularly powerful when we can programmatically link back to machine-readable requirements, such that we can annotate the requirements view both with the current status but also where to find tests relating to a particular feature. The most important thing though is that the documentation stays up to date and therefore it should be managed in source control in the same fashion as the code itself. It's essential to get feedback about the current status of the code base. This status should be visible for all branches and available to the whole team to see. The faster the feedback the more useful it is. Developers have short attention spans and we should aim to give some indication about the quality of a change set in well under a minute. If we get down to single digit seconds, then we can start looking at using pre-commit hooks rather than post-commit hooks to trigger our tests. It isn't only simulations that our continuous integration system can run. Documentation, block level synthesis, linting tools, hardware regressions, these can all be automated. In fact, sometimes our simulation tests will pass, but we've introduced undesirable timing or resource usage into a system, and we need to detect those as early as possible, as well as just test failures. Automatically synthesizing every single revision at the block level and pulling out various metrics makes it easy for us to detect when something bad has happened. There are several great free tools available that make setting up continuous integration very straightforward, and this is an easy win for any team. One of the most popular of these is Jenkins, which Alan will be giving uh, some more detail about in the talk later on. But as a quick example, I'm sure you can all spot the change set on these graphs that accidentally doubled the resource utilization of one of our blocks. For this particular block, a lint pass, full 100% coverage, simulation regression, synthesis build, and documentation all takes about 40 seconds to complete. And that's on a VM running on a mediocre desktop machine. So we can run this for every single check-in. By tracking all this information at the block level, we have a powerful indication of the current status of our code base, and it's all visible from a web browser. And again, this ties into improving the communication, making the status of the code base easily available to anybody who's interested, without requiring them to be intimately familiar with the code base or the, the layout of our tests or the, the, the simulation environment. Hopefully, some of these topics sound interesting to you and worthy of further investigation. We've been fortunate enough to work with several companies to assist them in improving their development flow, and I'd like to share with you a few of the difficulties we've encountered. Many of these can be summed up as a general resistance to change. We're all creatures of habit, and there's a definite inertia to development that makes it difficult to introduce any changes. Often, objections are, are completely valid. If it's not broken, then don't fix it. However, it's important to objectively evaluate where gains could be made. If a blanket refusal to consider new ideas 
Trump's proposed changes every time, then we'd probably still be drawing out circuit diagrams by hand. We mustn't underestimate how important it is to ensure that our developers are happy. Sometimes steps can be simple and obvious. For example, if we need new skills in a team, then providing the option of training will go a long way to helping a transition. But sometimes the options are less straightforward. Optimizing our development process is one thing, but understanding the different personalities involved and the strengths and weaknesses of our teams is decidedly non-trivial, and Agile is not a miracle cure. There are also often confounding factors that are completely outside of our control. Uh, crazy company structures that hamper communication, or purchasing rules that make it impossible to access tools that would be demonstrably beneficial and cost-effective. To solve these kind of issues requires a genuine commitment and support from senior management. But in summary, uh, my message is that we should treat development much like any other engineering problem. It's true that many things are opaque or subjective or difficult to measure, but we can still try and dispassionately evaluate our progress and find areas for improvement. One thing is certain, if we don't continually innovate and improve, then one day we'll be outpaced by a faster, more efficient and more nimble competitor. There is a lot we can learn from the software development flows, but not everything from software domain translates directly to hardware or FPGA projects. Ultimately, Agile is about common sense and being open to new ideas, and that's something I hope we can all wholeheartedly support. Thank you for listening.